<laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Kayla Casali. I'm the grad assistant for LGBTQ affairs here. Um, I actually graduated from here in 2014, so it's my second year uh, in this position. I'm going to uh, do this safe zone training with you today. Sorry for the delay. We had a little problem with printing, but we're ready to go. So let's do it. I'm passing out. Um, yeah. Passing out the workshop packet right now. All you got to do with this is read through the front and side and bottom. It's not being collected, it's just for your own use, okay? So, Kayla and I had the. <laughs> Kayla and I had the um, teacher experience today of sending these packets to be copy and at 3.30 found out that the copy center wasn't going to have the money for us. So as teachers, we did the tap dance and she emailed <laughs> it to me and I hear we did it uh, a little differently, but I think it's always fun and interesting to point out that um, not everything goes perfectly regardless of how long you've been working with groups or in the classroom. So keep all the lights on, can everybody see pretty well or yeah, we're good? All right, um, basically what we're going to do here, did everyone sign the front? So once we're all set with that, just look to the second page and we're going to go over like the rules and stuff. Not really the rules, just more of like guidelines for the whole workshop. Pretty standard. All right, number one. The goal is to educate and promote the need for respect, equality, and support for the LGBTQ community. This workshop is a safe space, and we invite all questions. That means there's no stupid questions in this room, so you can ask me whatever you want. Um, and on top of that, discussing feelings is really important, so whatever is said in this room, please maintain confidentiality with your peers. Um, we don't seek to speak for all LGBTQ people. It's very um, broad spectrums of identities and things. And so we're just going to try to show you some like common trends. But um, these don't always apply to everyone that you meet. So just keep that in mind. Um, and unlike all the workshops or any other workshops that you might go through, we're not going to go through every single thing in the packet. That's more for, um, for you to use uh, outside of the workshop for, for additional understanding. Um, does anyone have any other ground rules they want to add before the workshop starts? No? All right, great. Then you can flip to the page three, the cycle of oppression. All right, so this is just basically um, an outline of how oppression works, and it doesn't have to just be queer identities. It can be race, it can be gender, it can be socioeconomic class, anything like that. Um, so this kind of cycle is what informs all sorts of stereotypes and forms of oppression. So with that, anyone want to tell me what a stereotype is in your own words? I know it's in the packet, so. <laughs> no me. Don't all jump at once. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So it's a generalization. It can be either positive or negative, but stereotypes, um, even though they're not considered positive or negative, like a positive stereotype would be like, oh, you're so tall, you must be good at basketball. That's a stereotype, um, but it's not really a negative one. So just keep that in mind. They don't all have to be negative. But stereotypes are what inform prejudice prejudices. So when they are negative, um, they inform our prejudices, which is a negative belief about a whole group of people instead of just that one person. Um, and those can be unconscious or conscious stereotypes. So when you combine prejudice with influence, you have discrimination. Who wants to tell me what discrimination is? Come on, people. Wake up, wake up, wake up. <laughs> Confidential, even if you say the wrong thing. Doesn't matter. Yes. So would it be like, um, you're just, so you, I'm not going to play with you because you're like, Black is, that's a discrimination, right? That's, yeah, that's a form of, yeah, prejudice and discrimination. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Like you're discriminating, you won't do something because of their stereotype. Yeah, that's right. Okay. 
cheese. Yeah. Anyone else want to add to that? So how do we get to oppression from discrimination? What's the difference? Power. Power. Sorry, it's okay. Power. Yeah, you don't, you don't have to do it. You guys can just like, it's a workshop, so I don't have to call on you. What else? Difference between discrimination and oppression. There's one really important word. Systematic. Oppression is systematic. Discrimination can apply to individuals, um, specific groups of people, but oppression is you're oppressing a whole entire group of people. So oppression would be like systematically oppressing blacks, system systematically oppressing LGBTQ, systematically oppressing trans people. It's all, it's, it's a, um, it's an institution, right? Who knows what? So would the woman who wouldn't marry um, gay people in her community, would that be a form of using stereotype to oppress her? That is. That is a form of oppression because she's using her power in her position to deny that right. Yeah, totally. Wow. All right, going off of that, who knows what internalized oppression is? Yeah. Um, I just read it, but going off. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, to my own words, um, more like a self fulfilling prophecy. Like if you hear something too many times, you're like, you start to believe it. Yeah, exactly. So people will hear stereotypes of or about themselves or the identity group that they're um, a part of, and they'll start to internalize that. Once they hear it over and over, they might start to buy into that stereotype. So that's why we go right back to stereotype, because people who hear these stereotypes about themselves might start to actually perpetuate them. Does anybody have questions on cycle oppression before we move on? All right. Oops. Where do we go backwards? There we go. All right, so if you flip to the next page, actually the next couple pages, you're going to see a bunch of definitions here. So this is the part, this is the only part I'm going to ask you to do some reading. I'm going to give you like five to ten minutes to read through some definitions here. And then we're going to just mark down any definitions that you struggle with, you want to make changes to. Um, you have a comment on, the clarification, and then once you go through that, we're going to come back together and we're going to talk through those definitions just so we're all kind of on the same page for the rest of the workshop. Everybody about all set? Yeah? All right, so let's flip back to page four then. Under the section that says biological sex-related terms, does anybody mark anything down there? No? Everybody knows, yeah. Medically unacceptable. Medically unacceptable, yeah. That's, that's one that comes up a lot. Um, so for intersex people in the United States, um, what happens when somebody is born intersex, they don't allow them to live that way. Um, for doctors, they don't have a classification for people like that. They um, classify them as being born intersex, but something needs to be done about it. They can't live that way. So um, actually, a law was recently proposed to stop doing this, but now um, these children are having uh, surgeries that will put them in one gender box or the other one, and that's ultimately up to the doctors and the parents of who they are going to be raised as, um, but that's why it's, it's written as medically unacceptable, because they don't allow you to live that way, typically. Do you have any other questions on intersex? Yeah, so now children who are born um, trans, gender, no, 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 now they're born intersex, wait to have surgery done? Well, or that's, that's yeah. what they're trying to pass, yeah. They're trying to pass the law saying that too many of these kids are being raised in the gender identity that's not their correct one, um, and so they end up being trans later in life. So they're saying that instead of giving these intervention surgeries, because being intersex doesn't really affect your life at all, like you can, you can live totally normal life being intersex, um, so they're saying that these surgeries are not medically necessary and that they should stop doing them until the child can decide if they even want to change, you know, whatever. There was another question over here somewhere. Did yeah. answer? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, does anybody know why we don't use the term hermaphrodite anymore? It's an outdated term that we don't use. Yes. Isn't it seen as derogatory for a lot of people that group? It is. Do you know why? Um, 
I learned about it in human sexuality, but I, like, I just know that it was derogatory and like it makes them feel like down on themselves for who they are. Yeah, so a hermaphrodite um, in biology is actually an organism that can reproduce on its own. Um, so it would it would be able to um, possess both male and female um, sex characteristics, and it would be able to capitalize on that and actually reproduce itself. So intersex people do not have that. They're more of, um, of either blended appearance and genitals or a hormonal thing. So anyone can really be intersex and not even know it. It's who has their chromosomes tested, right? Like most people don't. Um, so they say that the documented percentage of people that are intersex is 0.02. Um, but it's actually believed to be more like 2% of the population is intersex. So, here's that. Is everyone good on intersex? Move on? Alright. Gender identity terms. What do we have marked down there? So there's two answers to that, really. Transgender can be used as an umbrella term for anybody that's um, kind of like not on the binary spectrum, or it can be used as somebody who actually transitions their gender to a certain degree. Transsexual is only used for people who, who do, do um, medical interventions to transition their gender, um, but that's very much uh, like a personally claimed term, so transsexual really shouldn't be used in any context unless somebody says that they identify. It's kind of like moving out towards the outdated. Yep. Um, what's the difference between gender queer and two spirit? Um, that's actually a really good question. So if you see gender queer, non-binary, and agender, those three definitions are really similar. I'm sure all of you noted noted that. Those are um, three words that can kind of be used interchangeably, and people can just kind of choose the identity that they want to go with. Two spirit is actually different in that it's um, for Native Americans only in certain tribes, and they're actually intersex, queer, or transgender people who live um, in sort of a balance of masculine and feminine characteristics, and they're really highly respected in their community. So instead of where we look at intersex people as unacceptable and we have to correct that, they actually like worship that. So that's the term in their culture for um, intersex or LGBT. Um, the difference is actually that stealth is an in-group term. It shouldn't be used by anybody that's not part of the trans community. 
that's um, for trans people only to be saying to each other, they're like, oh, you look really stoked today. That means that you're passing really well as a cisgender person. Um, everyone knows what cisgender means? Yes? Okay. Um, whereas passing is like, you could be saying that about somebody else. Be like, oh, they're really passing today. You know? So that's, that's the only one I really want to point out there. What about under sexual orientation?
we have our gender unicorn here. They are, um, we're going to use they pronouns on them because we don't know what gender they identify with. But, so if you look at the thought bubble at the top, it's the rainbow. Rainbow co corresponds to gender identity. What do we see when we look at this scale? How much you identify with each of those. Exactly. So what does that eliminate from that over there? What problem does it eliminate? That you're one of the Exactly. So for gender identity, this is particularly problematic because you have, say you have like masculine and you have feminine and you have androgynous in the middle. If you put yourself like here, that's saying you're like mostly masculine, but you can't be here at all, right? This takes that away. Gender identity, if you're in this like zero here, that means you don't identify with that trait at all. If you're on this side, that's like, yeah, I'm totally that, right? We have the female line at the top, male line, and other genders would be trans, non-binary, gender, queer, any sort of expression like that. Gender expression presentation, as we talked about, is how you project your gender to somebody else. Feminine, masculine, or other. That would be other would be your non-binary trans status, androgynous, whatever. Sex assigned at birth. Why am I saying sex assigned at birth instead of biological sex? Maybe. This is a new trend in the trans community that we're trying to get away from saying biological sex and we're moving to sex assigned at birth. Why do you think that is? Yeah. Is it because like some doctors can like take people and people have two? Well, that would be intersex, but not really. So oh, never mind. Yeah, never mind. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We have intersex identity 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 biological too. Just what? Isn't your gender identity biological too? Gender identity is not biological. No. Um, sex assigned at birth is actually. So when you say biological sex, you're implying that something is fixed, can't be changed, can't be modified. It's your biology. It's biological. You can't change it. Sex assigned at birth. For trans people, this is really important because they say, I was assigned this at birth, but I am no longer this. Does that make sense? So you're, you're validating that previously this was their biological identity, but it's no longer. Because they've had, they might have had hormone replacement, they, they might not remotely resemble what they were assigned at birth. So that's why we're trying to um, stick to that. And that one's just female, male, or other intersex. And then another thing that gender unicorn does instead of gender bread, is it separates sexual attraction and romantic attraction, which is really important because somebody could be sexually attracted to women, but romantically attracted to men too. They just don't want to have sex with them. It happens. So we're going to fill this out real quick. This is like um, just an example. Then you want to take a stab at who this unicorn is. Tell me about them. How were they born? How did they identify? How did they express? It's hard, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's why I see you pack it so you can like actually take some time with this, because if you fill it out for yourself, it becomes a little bit more clear. It's okay if you're wrong. So are we going to know from what that is? Or are we going to oh, you, you don't have to do it right now. It's, this is totally just for your use. So if you want to fill it out for yourself, you can. Oh no, I'm saying we can figure this one out now. But oh, okay. if you want to use this to like fill out your own so that you can familiarize oh, yourself okay. with it. Okay. Yeah. But we're gonna work through this one. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so this is a guess. Would it be a trans woman who is sexually attracted to women but romantically attracted to kind of everyone? You're like pretty on the right track. So <laughs> <laughs> this person or this unicorn, I'm sorry was born male, mm -hmm. now their gender identity is female, not at all male, right? Not at all. But they do identify with their trans status a little bit. So they're not saying, I want to be perceived as female all the time. I, they don't care if you know that they're trans, is basically what that means. Some people do. Gender expression. 
mostly feminine, but they can have some masculine traits, right? All of us have masculine and feminine traits, so that makes sense. Sex assignment birth, very went through. And then sexual attraction, mostly women, sometimes men, but they're also attracted to trans, non-binary people. Um, and same with romantic attraction. So you see why this is a little bit better than having these binary mm -hmm. spectrums? Because since we're trying to break the binary, this is still binary. So that doesn't really help much. Um, but yeah, like I said, this is in your packet, so definitely spend some time going through this, and it will get easier to understand. Um, it's a lot at first. Does anybody have questions on the gender uniform? Yes. What if they're romantically and emotionally attracted to, like, is it just like, I'm, like, I'm trying to figure out, like, is it more like a friend, like, relationship with others, or is it like... No, so, like, if you think of, say, asexual people, right? Mm -hmm. Asexual people, contrary to some popular belief, actually do, can experience romantic attraction to people. Um, just as anybody would in a romantic relationship, they're just not interested in sexual Okay, so like it's it's basically the same thing there. Any other questions? All right, great. Now we're going into Trans 101. Um, so I actually did add a new page to the packet. So this will be my first group that I'm teaching you to, not this one, but the next one. Um, but we're gonna start here. So the trans umbrella. I write trans with an asterisk at the top because that means that you're using trans <coughs> as an umbrella term and not to identify somebody who is necessarily transitioning, right? So with that, under the umbrella can, fall, can be any of these identities, genderqueer, agender, MTF, FTM, drag queens sometimes will say that they're um, in the trans community, not always. Um, but what I want to note about this is that say somebody is using genderqueer as their personal identity, they're, they're genderqueer, you don't want to necessarily assume that they they identify with being trans. So that's, <coughs> like I said, like everything else, it's just a self-identifier. But if you are trying to be inclusive and write trans and talk about a larger group of people, use the asterisks. Um, we're going to go a little bit more into this, but does anyone have questions on that? No? All right. This is actually the new slide that I added. Um, the workshop. I feel like A, we didn't have enough about trans people in here, and B, people don't um, always understand, and I feel like this is where people have a lot of questions. Am I right? Like, trans is something that people have a lot of questions about sometimes, and they don't necessarily have places to ask them. Um, so this is your chance to ask your questions. But um, what I tried to do here was go through what trans people might be experiencing. And if you have a trans student in your class in the future, you might want to know like kind of where they're at in their journey. So I broke this down into a few different categories, medical, legal, and social. Um, and what we have under medical is we have psychotherapy and visiting and endocrinologists, which are both um, requirements for, for transitioning. Um, under legal, we have gender marker changes on legal documents. So that would be say, saying your uh, driver's license originally said male, you want to change it to say female, that's legal. Social um, changes in gender expression, as we talked about, you might change your hair, your clothes, mannerisms, changing your pronouns, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, um, choosing a new name. And then between social and legal, we have name change on legal documents because that um, is a thing. You can adopt a new name and use it as we're about to try to pass the preferred name policy here. Mm -hmm. um, it won't require you to have a legal name change, but you'll be able to use on your university documents the preferred name that you choose which is really great, but that is a legal change. Um, and then between medical and legal, hormone replacements, um, that is a legal thing. You have to be signed off to do that. Um, and same with surgery. So that's just kind of the overview of transitioning. What I do want to mention here is that anybody who is trans might do um, like one of these things, they might do all these things, they might do half these things. Everybody's journey is different and sometimes people don't want everything. Um, so keep that in mind. But anyone have any questions on the like, process of transitioning? No? Okay. Well, I have a question. Yeah. So would medical insurance cover this? Or someone? 
All right, so um, the way that works is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the DSM, uh, previously had, actually had homosexuality in it, um, and then that was taken out in 1986, I believe. And then it now still does have being trans in, as a mental disorder. It's listed like that because in order to bill insurance, you have to have a med medical diagnosis. Um, so that's the only reason that it's still left in there, but it is a medical diagnosis, yes. Um, called gender dysphoria. Did that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Any other questions around that? Awesome. All right, let's move into pronouns. So, why are pronouns really important? Just in general, why are they important? What do they do for us? <laughs> yeah. So people are are identified as gender every day by their pronouns, right? You're talking about someone, you're like, oh, he did this, she did that. I'm going with him. You know? So pronouns are really, really important, and especially for trans people and non-binary people who might not identify with these pronouns. Or trans people who are switching their pronouns and people aren't necessarily understanding that and they're using the wrong ones. That's misgendering in a form of outing, which is dangerous for some trans people. Um, and for people that are non-binary and don't necessarily identify with being female or male, they might want to use gender-inclusive pronouns, which we're trying to encourage um, all across campus, just because we do have many, many more students each year coming that are identifying with gender-inclusive pronouns. So, but especially you're going to be seeing this um, in younger ages, high schools especially. Um, I don't know, what age group are you all going to be teaching? High school? Perfect. It's like a mixture? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, pronouns are going to be pretty important for that. Um, so we have, you know, he, she. This just kind of shows you, you know, in the context that you would use it. So you can use this to um, kind of figure out the way that you're going to use the pronoun. They is a pretty good gender-inclusive pronoun just because um, it's not specified. And you can use it to pretty much refer to anyone that you're not really sure what their pronouns are. People aren't going to be offended if you use the they pronoun. Z is a little bit different because Z is a pronoun that it's a specified one. So someone has to claim that as their own pronoun. You can't just be like, oh, Z did this, Z did that. Because that's, it's like using he or she, but that person has to claim that identity. So they is a safer bet if you want to know what gender inclusive pronoun to use in the classroom, maybe. But if you do have Z, it's probably the top pronoun under they. So here's the pronun uh, pronunciations for that for you. But what I wanted to do. I have two activities for you, not really activities, um, that will kind of help you in your classrooms. But the first one that's not is just pair up with the person next to you and form a few sentences using gender inclusive pronouns. And then we'll come back together and we'll share them. And then I have like an activity for you for your classrooms. Like one bit. Is it up to the student to come to the teacher and to identify that they want the Z pro We're going to be implementing that in the preferred name policy. Yeah. I'll talk about that later. Because, you know, if the teacher makes sense that you don't want to do it until they have true. True. You have to have Yeah. That's the first thing anybody asks when they go to Arkansas. He says, well, I lived in Arkansas for a while, and then we moved out to Virginia, and I said, oh, so I'm going to go to Arkansas. I'm going to go to the Arkansas Museum border, and da 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 Where's was your family in the military that you moved to Arkansas? Oh, I do. I do. Yeah, this is awesome. This is really good. Uh, really marriage, and so, or marriage, and so my mother decided to stay there. I was like, you know, what? You know, I don't know. You know, I've been making out with Virginia. Yeah, well, that, yeah. That's a little yeah, different. Yeah, maybe they were able to marry in Arkansas and then move on. I don't know. Maybe, I mean, and then his teacher made him go finish his work, so I didn't get the cost. Teachers are so, you know, ready to tell me. What's the difference It's pronounced here instead of her. I don't hear it. See, that's what she is. It looks like her. It's here. 
if, if you're not like out as a non-binary person, you're probably going to stick to your he, she pronoun. Um, what was your other, you had a second part of that? I think my other kids. Oh, um, oh, for for other kids. Yeah. yeah so another yeah. so another way that you might do that is if you're concerned about that. If you're concerned that there's like maybe one kid in your class that's mm -hmm. that's non-binary or trans and everyone else is cisgender, then instead of doing that, you might want to do something like probably had classes here that professors will distribute like an index card and they'll be like fill out your name and your hometown and your major. I would just say hey, put your pronouns on here too, and that way everybody is putting their pronoun and you're aware of it, but being more creative about um, how other students will get that information is, is the problem there. It's like a little bit different. I don't have all the answers for that, I don't. But <laughs> you're gonna have to be creative as teachers to figure that out. It's definitely yeah. important. Because I'm just thinking about from all the years that I taught language mm -hmm. arts mm -hmm. and when you teach pronouns and when students write and things like that, that that's a whole new way to right. wrap your head around the yeah. use of written language. It's as very as hard as for academics, language. especially yeah. to especially with the they, just because it's it's used right. to refer to groups of people right. rather than individuals. Right. So it's it's not necessarily grammatically correct. Um, so academics do have a lot of trouble with that. Um, but actually, if you're thinking about that, the first person to actually use gender inclusive pronouns was Shakespeare. He actually had um, gender neutral characters in his plays, and he used. Uh, gender inclusive pronouns for them. So if you're worried about uh, grammatically correct, there you go. Just to go off that, um, I like went to Germany, so like I know German fluently, and what they do is like the capital Z, S I E, refers to people you don't like. That's how you would refer to a teacher because you like can't, like you're not like friends with them, so mm -hmm. you have to like refer to them as Z. But you can also it also mean like they and groups of people. So yeah, totally. Like this that. is yeah. This is um very much like an English language thing. A lot of other languages um, will have either a third gender or a way to differentiate that. Um, but also, that you mentioned Germany, they just passed a law that instead of when babies are born for the birth certificate, they actually passed a law that you can have a third gender that's not male or female. So Germany's pretty ahead of us in terms of uh, this kind of stuff. But, yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna stop talking so much this, but no, no, keep going. As a future English teacher, how do we get around the whole grammatically incorrect words mm -hmm. are actually teaching us? <laughs> we just be like, I'm not an English teacher, so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> or is it just like they can be groups of people, but it's also like a gender inclusive thing, which is like throw it in there? Yeah, I mean, with this like up and coming, by the time that you're teaching, it should be a little bit more um, standard. Not, It's not going to be standard by any means, but it should be a little bit more to the point that if you're teaching pronouns, you can. Teach them as you would normally, but just be like, just as a side note, they can also be used as, you know, a gender inclusive pronoun if they're not already being used in that context. Anyway, yeah. Any other questions? Pronouns? I need to um, say presenting this and the people that just are oblivious to this. Yes. And so then you're going to get a lot of questions like, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. I did um, <coughs> last. Spring, I did my first open faculty workshop, and that's why I'm saying academics have a problem with this. <laughs> <laughs> that was not a fun room to be standing in front of. But that aside, yeah, <laughs> just keep that in mind. Um, yeah, that's basically it's more the grammatically incorrect thing than people just being like they don't know it exists. But some people don't know. Some people really are just like this is a thing that's going on. So if yeah. you present this to a grade, say a group of sixth graders. They can all know what you're no, about. not at all. No. Um, younger so kids, you? this is a lot less frequent among younger kids. Um, trans kids is coming up in the media now that we've had a lot more cases, and people are like, "What do we do about this? We don't know, you know, how to handle these kids mm -hmm. and get them the, the help that they need." Um, but kids that that age are not going to understand, or are not going to be already aware of pronoun differences unless they have somebody close to them. Um, high school, they start talking about this. I mean, if you had a kid in the class, I would definitely address it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I would say probably middle school, like later middle school age, probably would be when it gets. Mm -hmm. High school students should already be starting to learn about it. I think. Anyone else? All right. Um, this section is a 
little bit, we usually skip over it just because it's kind of um, a little bit self-explanatory, I guess. But can anybody tell me the difference between bisexuality and pansexuality? Do you have anything Yeah. Yeah. Uh, isn't bisexual someone attracted to both males and females while they pansexual attracted to? Anything? Any, yeah, not anything, anyone. Um, so, like, um, men, women, trans people, non-binary people, that would be, that would fall under pansexual. Bisexual is more like binary genders. Um, so that's really the difference there, but we call that the invisible identities because, um, if you see somebody that's like, you see a guy walking down the street holding hands with a woman, you're like, oh, look at that straight couple. You see a guy walking down the street holding hands with a guy, you're like, oh, look at that gay couple. In reality, either one of them could be bi or pan, you just don't know. So that's why we call them um, the invisible identity. So it's important to be aware of that and um, not jump to assumptions like that. That's basically the only um, thing we touch on in that section, unless anybody really has further questions about it. No? All right. So this section requires some participation. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about how we've grown up and like where we've come to understand people. So, first question. When and how did you come to know that all people were not straight or cisgender? Some people have like really exciting stories about this where there was like this really big aha moment for them. And other people are just like, I had gay on my whole life and this. Anyone want to share? experience for you that was more positive neutral kind of thing yeah, yeah totally thank you anybody else yeah my friend told me she was bisexual when we were like 10 and I had like no idea what that meant wow but yeah um but like she had never done anything about it so like she kind of went to like me to I was like the first person she could match him so and um I guess it was positive because like Closer, but um, yeah, that's how I figured it out. I had to like look it up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. well, yeah, ten years old is especially for bi. Not yeah. Really, like yeah. yeah, that's that's interesting. Wow. Anybody else? What about how did you realize not all people were cisgender? That's how I kind of, that was my story at least. My mom is 
pretty religious. I grew up in a very closed-minded town, and I thought gay people were weird, and look at me now. So, I mean, that's fun. So, here we go. All right, so we're going to do... I'm going to skip the popular stereotypes, just because we already talked about why being trans is in the DSM still. Um, and we're going to go into an activity here. Favorite or most important? So you're gonna, you have numbers one through five on your page. First number, please write down your favorite person that is not a family member. That's gay. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if they are, that's fine. <laughs> not a family Sorry. <laughs>
Later in life, you found your ideal job and life is good. You're at work one day and you have a picture of your partner and child on your desk. Your boss walks by and asks about them. You tell them who they are and she says great and goes on her way. The next morning, you get called to a meeting where your boss tells you that the company's downsizing and they'll have to let you go. Cross that off your list and open your eyes. All right, so take a look at your pages. You have lines through all these important things in your life. How did that activity feel for you? Sad. Upsetting. Discouraging. Discouraging. I just want to give up. You want to give up? Yeah. So this is a real, this is a very real thing for for some people in the community that they might have to deal with one, two, or all of these things. Some people are lucky enough to deal with none of them. Um, but it's all a very personal journey, so just keep that in mind when you meet people that any number of these things may have happened to them. Um, and that was what this activity was meant for you to do, was kind of put yourself in that situation and see these things, you can't have them anymore. They're gone. Just because of who you are, you can't have them anymore. So, that was that. So how might this um, impact students on campus, or students that you might teach, maybe? Especially high school students. Well, especially if, like, number two, like, if their mom or dad kicked them out of the house, like, mm -hmm. you know, exactly. just want to give up, like, not care about school, maybe stop going, stop doing homework. Sure. Like, whatever, like, just all around give up. Yeah, especially for students that you guys will be teaching, um, the family support is going to be one of the biggest ones, just because if you do lose that at that age, um, that's a very difficult thing to come back from. So keep that in mind. Any of your students, you might have students come out to you. We're going to talk about coming out process. Um, things like that, but just keep that in mind. All right, going into coming out, um, we like to make it known that coming out, when we think of it, we think of it as like this one-time deal where like somebody's like, oh, hey, I'm, I'm gay, and that's it. And then you're like, oh, great, this person came out. But that's not it. Coming out is actually not a one-time thing. It's actually an everyday thing. Um, for queer people, trans people, anybody, anytime they meet someone new, anytime they take a new job, anytime that they move to a new area, you have to determine if that place or that person is safe for you to be out to. Um, and some places aren't, and some places are. Um, but it's just really important to remember that just because somebody has come out once or is out to a certain group of people doesn't mean that they're done coming out. So this is very much something that they're going to be dealing with for the rest of their life, probably, and be coming out to people. Um, so that's important to keep in mind. Um, here's preventing people from coming out. What do you think people, why, why do people stay closeted? That they don't lose all that stuff that they just talked about. Yeah, that's what you're going to say. Yeah. What else? Fear of being accepted. Sure. Fear of being accepted. Fear of violence. Like if you want to learn more about it? Yeah, totally. Um, 
I think I would make that known to the person. So I would say, you know, I don't, I don't really know a full lot, but if, I mean, if you want to help me understand where you're at, if you want to help me understand your journey, yeah, totally. Um, I was just going to say in your packet, there's like some good questions to ask. Um, ask people um, and like ways that you can ask them. Um, for example, be inclusive about what you say. Um, use the identity that they give you, use the specific identity. So if they tell you that they're a lesbian, don't say, well, when did you know you were gay? Because some people, like, identities are very important and they're very personal, so make sure that you're acknowledging the that that's the identity that they give you. Anything else? All right. Um, the CAST model of identity development is the next one in your packet. You don't usually go through it in the presentation, but I do want to note that this is going to be something that's pretty useful to you if you do have a student um, that's maybe a little bit younger. This is kind of um, how somebody comes into their identity, the kind of basic process um, of what they might be going through. So if you know somebody that is coming out or in the coming out process or experimenting, you can kind of gauge where they're at in this process and what they might need um, from you. So that's something pretty cool to kind of look at if you have some time. Um, now we're going to go into privilege. Who knows what privilege is? It doesn't have to be like any sort of privilege. Just what is privilege? Yeah. Something you have that makes your life easier. Sure. How do you get privilege? From other people. From other people? Are we born with privilege? Are people Sometimes. in general born into privilege? Is what I was asking. Yes. In general. Okay. So. Going off of that, we have heterosexual privilege. Because um, heterosexual is the majority in society. Um, so anything that's that's not the majority is typically not looked at as a privileged identity. Um, there's a lot of privileged instances listed in here. But some of the ones that I like to point out, just because people don't usually have to think about these day to day, but once you know um, the things that might be privileged to them, you're like, oh wow, I didn't realize that was a privilege that I had. That I thought just thought that was something that I, you know, deal with. So um, a few of these, living with your partner and doing so openly without fear of safety. That's one. Paid leave from employment while grieving the death of your spouse. Um, that's something that's not guaranteed by all businesses at all. So if you're if you're in a marriage situation with someone of the same sex, you're not necessarily guaranteed paid leave. Die. Sad. Um, immediate access to your significant other or children in case of accident or emergency. A lot of hospitals will deny you visitation rights um, if you're not biological family, especially if your child is um, second parent adopted. Depends on the, um, the state that you're in. Legal invalid marriage. That one is actually outdated because everyone can get married now, which is exciting. Um, belonging to the religious denomination of your choice and knowing your sexuality will not be denounced by religious leaders. I feel like the important one, does anyone else have? Yeah. Even though same-sex marriage is now, like, not those now legal, why are, like, the property laws and the why did those things come with? You, didn't. you know what else didn't come with it? Being allowed to divorce. So, yeah, weird, right? It's a whole separate law. So there is actually, I actually have a friend um, who was married in the state of Maryland to someone of the same sex. After three years, they decided to break off their relationship. So they went to file for divorce and they said, sorry, can't get divorced. It's not legal in this state. So they're now dating other people, but they're legally married. Um, and it's just, it's by law, there's nothing that they can do about it. It's a whole separate law that needs to be passed, so a lot of states you can, but a lot of states you can't. So that's just something to keep in mind. How's that being tied to someone you don't like? <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments? Things that surprise you on this list? Yeah. <laughs> oh, wait, you can't raise adopt or teach children um, without people. So, But you can adopt children. In some states. Yeah. But not in all states. 
Actually, all the state laws are listed for you in the back of the package, too. So you can check that out. There's only certain seats if you're. And is there a difference between federal and state laws? There is. They're all state. Um, so the big thing with the Supreme Court from um, ruling on gay marriage is that it's federal. So it's all countries, and that's why um, the Kim Davis thing was such a big deal because they're saying this is a federal law. You can't be, you know, denied because you're really just right. Um, but yeah, adoption are all state laws. Um, divorce is all state laws. Um, public housing and discrimination, all state laws. So yeah, federal was only for marriage. It's not for anything else. Oh. Um, all right, there's the next page is cisgender privilege, which is pretty much, you know, the same kind of um, deal here. Can you be reasonably sure whether to check the MRF box on the gender form? That's a huge one, especially for students applying to Roger Williams University when we only have an MRF box on our application. Um, the law school actually doesn't. They offer a third um, area, and we're trying to get that with the preferred name policy, which I'm going to talk about in a moment because I keep forgetting to. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so that's one big one. When you're looking at a form to fill out and you're like, oh, what do I do? That's a big thing that people feel. Um, let's see. Are uncontrollable parts of your identity defined as mental illness? So if you are trans and you are seeking treatment, you do have a documented mental illness in the eyes of the law. What else? What might come up? What might come up for you if you're not cisgender? Based on, on this, what, what surprises you? You're like, oh, I never really had to think about that. A lot of things. Yep. What about like you have to go to the bathroom? Mm -hmm. That's what I see. Yeah. So that's why we're trying, we're, we have 29 gender neutral bathrooms on campus now, I think, 28 or 29, which is really big because last year we only had two. Um, so yeah, SAFE put that through and they got 29 of them, which is really exciting. But um, that was a big thing for, for students on this campus that they got a lot of backlash in their campaigning about. Um, but when you put it into perspective, you're like, oh, well, that really does matter for some people. So yeah, keep that in mind, that's important. Anything else on cisgender privilege? I just like number 11. Yeah. You just have to bring the clothes on and return them. Yeah, we're actually um, for uh, Trans Week of Remembrance, which is coming up in two or three weeks now. We're actually going to be doing a campaign that's uh, it's going to be called Safe With Me. Um, and we're going to have like buttons for people to fill out. They're saying, I'm a trans ally, and I will accompany you into a bathroom so that you don't get um, or you don't have to feel like you'll be assaulted or anything like that. You feel safe. Um, so that's going to be our new campaign for Trans Week of Remembrance. Cool. See it coming up. But yeah, um, another university just did it and they said it was like super, super successful. They had a much higher trans population than we do. Um, so it'll be a little bit different, but I think it's just the principle of the matter is mm -hmm. having it there. So yeah. Um, before I move on, I did want to talk about the burning policy because I totally forgot. Wait, I have a quick question. Yes. So for the elementary level, having a girls' line and a boys' line, yeah. should we just like nix that, 86 that, and just have two, like when we walk down the hallway, just two lines? Or, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like, should we This totally is This is very hard at the elementary level. This is a really tough thing that they're doing. Because, I mean, my students will honestly just line up boys' and girls' line on their own. Right. And I think that's just... A pro like that's how we grew up totally and I think that's how children so what if we just and my, my kids are first grade so even if I didn't because I think we started off the year boys line girls line boys line later girls line later so uh, do you think it would be better just to have you know two lines make sure they're even you can do two lines make sure they're even that's interesting because I mean essentially my boys line and girls lines are so like not it's not even a good idea because I have like 16 I have double the boys in my class that I do girls so you know what I mean like mm -hmm. would it be better for us to just not do the whole girls line boys line maybe not I mean that would be something to experiment with elementary is is a very hard area for this right now yeah. um, just because yeah. 
more and more kids are coming out with gender identities that don't match what they were assigned at birth, um, and people don't really know what to do about it. They're just kind of like, okay, well, we can't really give you hormones right now, but we, can't, we don't even know if you need them. So, like, we don't even know what bathroom to put you in, because then what are the other kids going to say? But in reality, in elementary schools, if you watch documentaries on um, trans kids that are actually allowed to live as they choose, it's not the kids that have a problem understanding, usually. Yeah, it's, always um, it's not the other kids in the class. The other kids in the class would be like, oh yeah, that's Johnny, and it's fine, like, doesn't matter. I don't understand what the big deal is. But it's adults that are really kind of having trouble um, getting into it. So I think if you make it something that's normal to the kids and just be like, we're going to change it up, we're going to have one line today, and I don't think it's going to make I don't think it's any difference. I think kids are very receptive to that, whereas adults take a little bit more overthinking and time for it. So yeah, you definitely have to be creative though, for sure. It's not necessarily a, um, a good or bad thing trans-wise. It's a gender, more of a yeah. gender issue of rather of here are the girls and here are the boys. So we have to separate the girls and the boys for what reason we don't know. Do the boys always get to go first to the group? However that, so you need to start to incorporate language when you're having movement or transition in your classroom that um, invites students to join a group because their birthday's in December. Right. Yeah, maybe because they you know, the, the, or, or, you know, scan. Or red so shirt, shirt, blue shirt, green red, shirt, yes. purple shirt. Yeah. Well, I, I'm talking about like a quick and easy way for when we go to itinerants or when we right. go to lunch. Right. Right. Yeah. Same, okay. Same thing. Yeah. First thing starts with line 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 girls and boys. They don't know when they're birthday. Yeah. <laughs> no, but you know what I mean? Like, think about, instead of saying, you know, like, instead of addressing them as boys and girls in the classroom, they're mathematicians when you're teaching math. They're scientists. I like that. They're scientists when you're teaching science. Okay. Yeah, I, that's, that's a yeah, I was just wondering, yeah, because that's, really that's great one. super typical, and I think that every, I don't think, I think a lot of classrooms, that's how they transition their students, so, and that is kind of the first thing that I thought of. Totally. So, that's a good one. I was just going to say, like, yeah. I don't know, yeah. my friend, really? and like, first grade, because I'm in the third grade, yeah. and we just, it just changes up all the time, but, I don't know if you also do, like, numbers by last name, like, yeah. number one. Oh, we have like numbers by last name, so like their list in alphabetical order, that's their number. So like Johnny, his last name starts with A, so he's one, and then all the way, like just have them line up like that, and then they'll know like if they're supposed to be in between. If you need it to be that much, like for me, we just call them up at the table, like it's, it changes. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I mean, and even when we, like I'll say, even, you know, when we transition to lunch, it's like, all right, I don't tell them like, okay, all the boys go line up, all the girls. I t I'll say, all right, well, you know, when you're done, go line up or whatever, and they automatically just go in a boys line and a girl. Even when we come from lunch, I'm like, all right, everyone, let's line up against the wall and let's well, that go. that makes sense though, because are they going into two other bathrooms, like two separate bathrooms? Yes. So that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're not going to know. They're just going to see, like, boys or girls, or they're not going to think anything else. Change it up. Yeah. Switch it up. Just switch it up. Figure out a way to line up by height. Nobody, you know, line up by height. Eyeball people line up by height. Yeah, that's it. It's not hard. Be creative. Yeah. Anyone else have questions on that? I just want to talk about the preferred name policy really quick, just so you know what's coming up and what you can um, maybe look for in your schools that you're going into. Um, so, does anyone know what a preferred name policy is? So, basically, um, this is something that's becoming more and more um, frequent at universities, especially. Um, it's a way for, like I said, instead of having a legal name change, which takes at least two years' time, basically, for somebody to um, to get a legal name change. For someone who is using a name that is going to be misgendered by the name, it's a big deal. So for classrooms, for rosters, for things like that, say you have somebody calling roll call and you say, where's Mary? And Mary is transitioning to be John. And you say Mary, but John raises his hand. That's going to cause a whole problem, right? 
So preferred name eliminates that. Preferred name, instead of having a legal name change, you can file something on file with the school saying, this is my legal name, but this is my preferred name. This is the name that I'm going by. These are my preferred pronouns. Um, and you'll be able to file that with the university so that they can change um, everything that's not an official document. So they can't change your transcripts. They can't change your there's like a few things that they can't change, can't touch it. But other than that, like class rosters will be changed, bridges will be changed, school emails can be changed, anything like that. So it avoids students being outed um, in situations like that. And along with the preferred name policy, whoever signs up for it and fills out that paperwork, they will also be given um, a system where they can put in all their professors um, and a, notif a notification will be sent to all those professors prior to the beginning of school saying you have a student in your class that identifies as trans or non-binary. This is the name that's on their official documents, but this is the name that they would prefer to be called by. This is the name that's going to show up on your rosters, and these are the pronouns that they use. Yeah? Is this just like at a collegiate level or like high school too? Some high schools are using them, um, and some, some high schools will allow you to do them anyway. Even as low as middle school, you see preferred name policies. We're actually a little bit behind not to have one at Roger Williams. Um, so hopefully it will be implemented this spring. We're pretty excited about that, but that's um, basically what's happening there. So I just wanted to, that's just the article about it just came out this week. It's in the office. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Does anyone have any questions on what a preferred name is? Or, we're good? It doesn't really go with this, it's just a side note. All right. Um, the results of heterosexism and cissexism are just um, like statistics for you for your own use. We don't go through them, um, but they're pretty interesting. I mean, there's no federal job protection for LGBTQ people in the U.S. Only 20 to 50 states offer anti-bullying laws for students um, based on sexual orientation, so that's a big thing. There, there are actually some student or school laws that we should probably just touch on here. I don't usually go through the state laws; they're all listed here for you. But I did just add some school ones um, that might be helpful to you. Um, anti-bullying laws that address both sexual orientation and gender identity. Only 20 states do that in their anti-bullying laws. Um, yes. Uh, yeah. The. No. Um, but the one, the big one here is anti-bullying laws prevent specific protection for LGBTQ. So in Missouri and South Dakota, if you are a queer student in a high school, middle school, even elementary school getting bullied, they legally cannot prevent you from that harassment. Why? So there is yeah. there is literally a law preventing them from protecting these students. So is it like Yeah, it's basically like you can bully these kids and nothing's gonna happen. But like you know how they say technically in some states you can still hit people, you can still hit yeah. students. A lot of laws are arbitrary. But like are, so are these arbitrary or is it just like they're they're pretty much? I mean those yeah. laws are still good. Yeah. yeah. They're they're laws. I just hope that these states aren't like condoning. I know. Um, also the bottom the bottom one the eight states laws restrict LGBT topics in schools. That means in any of those eight states. We cannot speak about LGBTQ anything in your classrooms. Oh, oh, okay. so, yeah. Like, oh, you cannot have it as a topic. In these states. You're probably going to have to talk about everyone in the street. In some of the yeah. 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 Like, you're just a yeah. 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 But I guess if they got it. Yeah. 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 Um, four levels of being an ally. 
Now is the person who actively works to eliminate the oppression and marginalization of LGBTQ individuals. This includes providing support to individual LGBTQ people as well as challenging heterosexism and homophobia. So the four levels of becoming an ally. We have awareness, knowledge and education, skills, and action. Awareness is how you would be, um, how you can interact with LGBTQ people and find common ground with them. So this is acknowledging that a, somebody's sexual orientation is not their only identity and it does not make up their entire life. So basically, this is like you're talking to someone and you're like, we're both football fans, that's so cool. I'm straight in your day, but we're both football fans. This is like acknowledging that this does not make people any different from each other. That's awareness. Knowledge education, understanding laws, like we just talked about, understanding um, how people might be affected in different areas, things like that. Skills, um, this is uh, like going to workshops like you're doing now. Just anything that you can do to like ramp up your um, your education and your allyship, things like that. And then action is actually confronting oppression or finding someone who can confront the oppressive act if you don't feel comfortable doing so, knowing your resources to, to do that. Um, and then beyond that, having educational moments with people as an ally. So as an ally, you're going to be coming across people, especially in schools. Um, you might see this as a teacher. You're going to have to confront things like this. Um, one thing is important to ask questions. Instead of just calling out somebody for, for bullying someone, ask them why they're choosing to do that. Because a lot of times we hurt other people with our words because we're internalizing things. We have something going on with us. So with students especially, this is a time where you don't want to scold them, but you want to have a teaching moment with them. So be like, why are you using that word? Why are you calling him that? Why are you, you know, get to the bottom of it and work through it. Um, remain positive. Try to stay positive. If you come at somebody, they're going to get defensive, probably. Try to avoid getting, them getting defensive. On top of that, knowing your triggers. Triggers are really important because as people who are allies, these things are really close to us sometimes, and sometimes that really um, gets to us in our own emotions. So like, for example, you really don't like when someone uses the word fag, right? And somebody you're confronting an oppressive situation and someone is you calling someone else a bag. That's a trigger for you and that makes you really mad. Knowing what to do when your triggers come up and how to handle them so that you don't overreact is really important. Um, but that takes you knowing what your own triggers are. So take some time and figure that out. Um, know that in any situation, it doesn't even have to be just with queer people, it can be with anything. If you have a trigger that sets you off, know how to deal with it if it comes up. Um, don't get angry, like I said, stay positive. Have a goal, know where you want your conversation to go, know where, what you want the end point to be, and come from a place of care. Be like, I'm doing this because I want this classroom to be safer for people. I don't, I'm not doing it because I want to punish you, I'm not doing this, I want it to be safe and inclusive for everybody. That make sense? Just kind of um, confronting things in a positive, constructive way. Allied guidelines. Um, this has a whole lot of information on it, so I just took the molded stuff and put it on top. But um, remembering not everyone is heterosexual or cisgender. So we're trying to challenge the idea that we have societal norms. I just read an article yesterday about um, giving transition hormones to children, trans kids, um, and it kept saying, well, the normal kids and the trans kids. Not obviously. Um, so, especially in, a, in an article that was written by a trans person, I can't believe I was reading that. But anyway, remember not everyone is heterosexual or cisgender. Keep in mind and try to be inclusive in your language and, and um, make this part of like your everyday life because the more that you do it, the easier it'll be and the more second nature it'll be. Examine your own biases. Like I said with triggers, everyone comes with their own biases that might be conscious or unconscious. Examine your unconscious biases and know how to um, how to deal with them. Know your resources. There's a whole bunch of resources for you in this packet. There's resources on campus here, um, in my office. Public safety has resources. Know what your resources are in any situation. So like when you go into your schools to teach, know what your resources are in that, in that situation because that's your, that's your ammo. That's like your power. Um, communicate, talk with people, uh, learn about them, support them. 
help but don't force. This is an important one. Somebody comes out to you, you might be like, oh, this person's finally accepted their identity, they're ready to come out, but they might only be ready to come out to you and not anybody else. So don't be like, oh, well, you, can, you should go come out to them, you should go come out to them. No. They come out to you, and you're like, oh, this is really great, I'm supporting you, but don't, don't push them further than they can go. Pretty self-explanatory. They'll come into it. Uh, feelings come first. You can just be a listening ear to somebody, and that might be all that they need. Um, providing a supportive atmosphere, self-explanatory. Educate people um, and advocate for people. Be conscious of differences in oppression. This is a really big one. Um, who knows what intersectionality is? So intersectionality is like the intersection of different identities. So say that you had a black trans person. Actually, trans women of color are statistically the highest murder rate of any identity in the United States, trans women of color. So we're going to say that be conscious of differences in oppression. White trans people have very different oppression than black trans people, right? Lesbians have different oppression than trans men, right? So be conscious of those differences and, and know that not everyone's, um, not the oppression that everyone experiences is not going to be the same, even if their identities are the same. Um, use inclusive language. So get used to using gender neutral pronouns and gender neutral language as we talked about. For example, if you're asking if someone is dating someone, say, um, are you seeing anyone rather than do you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend? Uh, confidentiality, we already talked about. Being, uh, keeping confidentiality, confronting bias. If you hear language, um, homophobic language, transphobic language, microaggressions, do your best to confront them or find somebody that can. Um, be visible. So participate in any events that might be supporting the community. For example, Pride Week, we do a lot of events. Um, show your support. Safe zone stickers are a way of showing support that I have there um, that you'll get at the end of this. Be 100% ally. So allyship, we have two different types of allies, right? We have a conditional ally and we have 100% ally. A conditional ally is somebody that, that says they're an ally, they're okay with queer people, they're whatever, but when it comes to like it being near them, they're like, uh, I don't know about that. Like, will, like, will you sign the petition for the per preferred name policy? Uh, I don't know about that. Will you sign the gender inclusive thing? Uh, I don't know about that. So like, that's a conditional ally. Being a 100% ally is like, yeah, I'm totally behind you. Like, I'm, I think you should be equal to cis people. I think you should have all the rights that I have. I think you should be able to divorce the people you want to divorce. Like, all things like that, 100% ally. And then encourage other allies. And um, this is like, allyship should be like a team kind of effort. You know, like it shouldn't just be like you being by yourself. You encourage anybody else. You don't have questions on that. Okay. Um, my action plan, we don't really do in the workshop. This is for your own use. Um, I feel like this is a very personal experience for someone to um, identify as an ally and, and really actively confront that, so I let you do this on your own. Um, but basically what you're supposed to do here is three things that you'll continue doing, three things that you think you're already doing well as an ally. Write those three things there. I will stop. Three things that you think are hurting your position as an ally that you either, either you use um, like some language that you don't think is something that you should be using or you know whatever, write those there and then I will start. Write three things that you'll start doing that you weren't doing before. For example, I will start using gender inclusive pronouns. Easy. So that's for you. And with that, that's pretty much the end other than um, the back of the packet we have um, any books and movies if you're interested in checking them out and then in the very back page you have your national organizations that deal with all sorts of LGBTQ issues and below that you have your campus resources. So that would be um, myself, uh, Candace in the Intercultural Center, um, when the safe meetings are, and if you want to get involved in Safe Zone, that's my contact information down at the bottom. Anybody have any questions? Yeah. Are there any books that you would recommend? for them to use if they need to use with younger children, hmm. elementary, middle school. I actually did just, um, I don't know the name of it, so forgive me, but I did just come across a book that was written for elementary students 
in the perspective of a trans elementary student. Um, and I hear that it's been doing really, really well in teaching um, like trans identity to kids. I haven't gotten my hands on it yet, so I don't remember what it's called. I think if you just Google that, though, it's like one of the only ones of its kind, so it should come up. So I know I had experience with elementary school students who have parents, mm -hmm. you know, or like close parents. relatives, yeah. and you know, having them try to have conversations with their classmates can be really good. Yeah, it's tough. Um, yeah, I don't know any direct resources like that, but um, we can definitely have a look into it, and I can get you some for sure. You just send a picture. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, going off that, like, you can just have, like, books about different, like, types of families. Like, there's books, like, my two moms. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Books like that. Like, my classroom has, like, five different books, like, of, like, lots of families, like, families, oh, like, that's awesome. like, just, like, having that definitely helps. Nice. Thanks. And I know there's a new book or that just came out recently about two um, male penguins who raised a little penguin in the New York Zoo or the Central Park Zoo that oh, is that's banned. Awesome. It's really cute, but it's banned in a ton of schools. Oh, wow. And oh. yeah, probably those eight states. It. Yeah, <laughs> it's banned in a lot of schools. So, but I was thinking it's a really cute, incredible book. Cool. That's and awesome. I don't, awesome. I don't want to tell it. It was part Lexi. of my banned book. I'm gonna look for that. Let's see. Do you have questions? Oh no, I was just gonna say that I was recently in the Rogers Free Library here in Bristol. And one of their new books is I Have Two Moms, and I read it, and it's and it's pretty. I mean, it's it's more of a it just basically explains how it's more of an adult problem and how kids don't care. That's awesome. So yeah, I would want to just go there. Do no. we have the other questions? Thank you. I want to. Thank you.